Oh, I forgot to update the thing. We're covering Season 5, Episode 10. Uh, Princess Spike. I don't care about updating it. Whatever. It just, I, okay. Okay. So, let's talk about this episode, shall we? Oh, yep. And that's screwed up. I'm just screwing up everything today. That's just, this. the, the, the day of screw-ups. That's what this is. Every now and again, yeah, I see the problem. Every now and again, I run into this problem. And I do. Uh, what I mean by that is... I've, I've talked about this recently. Uh, I talked about this cross, cross code. I... Where's the outline? Oh my god! Jesus! Can everything go wrong today? Is that just where we're at? Is that just there? Turn on the outline. Jesus Christ! Sorry, I'm still really pissed about that CPU thing. Like, if it was just a two-day delay, that's whatever, but I don't know when they're going to get another two CPU in. So that's a undetermined delay. That could be months. This could just be sitting here, ready to go, for months. One of the problems I run into when it comes to analyzing fiction is figuring out why something sucks. Saying it sucks is irrelevant. Hey, guys, this episode sucks. But no information is being conveyed. This is actually related to the previous episode. Where we were talking about... You're funny, Von Falkenstein. Where we were talking about uh, Slice of Life. That uh, nuance, that variety. Uh, what was it? Uh, he had a wonderful word. It was like... A, it was enriched. There we go. It was enriched because of the details, the nuance, and the subtlety. If you just say, good, then it doesn't work that way. If you say, well, the thing is, there was a light, flaky texture, which added to a little bit of a butter aftertaste, and every bite managed to push down through another layer, and the inside was so soft and warm that the actual flavor of the, the, the cookie, plus the, the chocolate, both kinds of chocolate, would kind of separate inside as you're taking a bite down. And now you actually uh, can taste, at that point, the chocolate starts to hit the roof of your mouth, which means for the next several minutes, as you're continuing to chew that, you continue to get flavor of chocolate as you're chewing through the cookie part. And I could keep going. Just describing taking a bite of a cookie, right? I could say it's good. Or it could actually go into detail. So it, I want to explain why this episode sucks. But I have to admit, I'm running into a bit of a wall on that. Because it's, it's just a very inconsistently structured episode. <sighs> well, I mean, maybe that's just the core of it. Let's just jump into it. So I know Ponyville sucks, right? And, and by Ponyville, I mean Equestria. They're not exactly the most organized people in the world. But 50 cities, three days, all of that sitting on one person. That's problem number one. And then we have the fact that Cadence, despite being present and apparently having the spare time to police Spike, isn't doing anything despite being a princess and everyone being all princess happy. By the way, I thought I was watching FF9 as I was going through this episode, because how often they repeat the word princess. Then there's the fact that... Nobody is actually willing to listen to anybody other than Twilight, despite the fact that there are three other princesses present, at least one of which is apparently not busy, which is even stranger because of the fact that none of them were willing to listen to anyone but a princess in general. Now, that one at least makes sense. That's just them being stupid. But it just kind of compounds all the other problems. Oh yeah, by the way, why is all this crap happening now, rather than yesterday or the day before or the week before? Why would you put off repairing the water main to the first day of a summit? Why would you put off chopping down all these trees to the first day of a summit? Explain that one to me. At least some of these things can be explained away. Okay, let's talk positive. I really like the statue. It's a really cool idea. Um, it's not very well done. 
I mean, it's just it's just a bunch of gems. But I absolutely adore the idea, and I want to I want to steal this idea from my own setting somewhere, of different people uh, all contributing something to you know basically making a melting pot, you know, a potluck kind of a thing, except more as a, a getting together. Uh, you know, magically... Yeah, the theme of the statue is phenomenal. I'll talk more about that later, too. But the idea that each of them contributes a little bit to making this overall piece, the themes of unity despite being difference, you know, it, it's what I usually call the Mass Effect thing. That's awesome, and I love that. I just wanted to comment on that real quick. Anyway, so then we cut to Twilight. She is, of course, very tired-looking. Good animation, good animation. Spike is then totally ignored. Note that Twilight actually flat out says, here's some words from Spike, my assistant, who says, hey, I'm here if you need me. Now, that's pretty normal, actually. Speaking as someone who has both seen and been to political conventions, as well as fan conventions, like game conventions or board game conventions or whatever, there's usually, like, the, the, the big name, and then there's, like... The assistants. And the assistants are usually the people who you're actually going to be dealing with because that's their freaking job! I'm sorry, if it's not obvious, this episode pissed me off. So the crowd is inconsiderate and stupid. <sighs> okay. Again, that's the easiest thing to swallow in this whole episode, that they're all princess happy. Because that's how we work in real life. We were just talking about this. This is so hysterical. We were just talking about this with Slice of Life just a few minutes ago. Because Slice of Life was all about, imagine if you only had the main characters. The problem is, in real life society, the overwhelming majority of attention goes to the main characters. We focus on the directors, we focus on the writers, we focus on the actors, right? We focus on the, the big three in TOS. I'll be talking about that a lot when it comes to the TOS ruminations. How so many of the episodes are, have lots of time and characterization and screen effort and everything that goes into Spock and Kirk and McCoy and that's kind of it. It is a common, common problem, and it's actually stupid because it's functionally, provably, objectively wrong. <laughs> so, it is at least understandable why they're so stupid, because people are that stupid. <laughs> I, I just, I love the timing, because we just had an episode about that, and now here we are. Whew. So. Um, I, I, this is a presumption on my behalf. I'm going to presume that Spike was involved in organizing this summit. You know why? Um, because he's her assistant, and he has been assisting Twilight for years? And that's how an assistant works. He's probably more familiar with this summit than anyone else other than Twilight herself. And I want, I want you to keep that in the back of your mind, because that presumption is going to form the basis of several things I'm going to complain about. Anyways. So. She's tired. She needs to go to bed. Yep. Okay. Been there. <laughs> Uh, she has the, the pile of books as, as pillows. That was actually really adorable. And then he goes to ask the bird to stop singing. Okay. A little bit overboard, but all right, sure. I'm with it. He could have closed a window, Spike. Just a thought. But okay, sure. Very minor. Then they're having a game outside. Okay. No, it makes perfect sense that people from all over the place would be engaging in that kind of activity, right? You know, you're going to have... It, to go back to the convention scene, oftentimes there's the there's the game room or there's the bar area or there's the place where people just gather to kibitz, right? That's pretty normal. So, yeah, a bunch of people out there playing uh, croquet or whatever they're playing. Sure, I'm with that. He asked them to stop. Okay, you know, that's not a big deal. And it's a polo, thank you. They're playing polo. Asked them to pause. Not really a big issue. Still, still, a, still not the best answer because what he probably should have done is close the window. But the other thing he could do is he could just ask them to move to another location, which he probably would have enough of a brain to do. But, okay, whatever. Then there, there's the trees. Now, I want to remind you that these things are actually called Dragon Sneeze trees. I want to pause for a moment and just mention how stupid that is. Okay, we're done. Moving on. So it's a public hazard, and it hasn't been dealt with before, as we've already complained about. Um, I, I don't even know where to start here. <laughs> I don't even know where to start with this. Why, yeah, why are those there? <laughs> why are they in that exact spot? Why haven't they been dealt with already? 
Why don't you use magic to deal with it? This is Canterlot, the place of unicorns. Probably be quieter, too. No? Okay, okay. Well, we're still only drifting into bad ideas. Let's go into the water main, because that's the next one that shows up. And yeah, he decides to use a chainsaw to basically knock down things instead of anything else he could be using. There's several options there. Speaking of someone who has both done work on and been around people doing work on you know, trees and stuff. There's options. I mean, you, you, you ever see the thing where they tie off the different trees with the different color things so they tell which tools they need to use for which trees? Have you ever seen that? That's a real thing. <laughs> you know, this tree we're going to need to bring out the chainsaw for. This tree we're going to bring. We're just going to be able to get with, with, with uh, clippers. And when I say clippers, by the way, you've probably never seen these. And, and I'm sorry. I'm sounding in, insulting. I apologize. I'm in a bad mood. When I say clippers, I mean like this, right? You have to use your arms to clip these things. These are not small. They're like this big. Funk. And they will absolutely sl snap through branches like that. That's what they're there for. But they're a lot quieter than... Now, if, if, if I'm not making my point clear, what's pissing me off more than anything else in this episode is the exact same thing that pissed me off in one of the only other blue episodes we've ever covered. I don't know if this is going to be blue or not. We haven't decided. That's Over a Barrel. Do you remember that? Way back in Season 1, Episode 21. That was the, uh, at least I think that's the episode. Pretty sure it's the episode. Yeah, it was the one where uh, they were like, oh my god, the buffalo, and then you gotta care, you gotta shit. You remember that one? Anyways, if you remember, you, I don't blame you if you don't, the biggest thing I did dislike about that episode, hi Twister, was the fact that it was a lot of Looney Tunes. You remember that? I don't mind humor. I don't mind slapstick. I don't mind comedy. I don't mind silly. What I mind is when it doesn't make any freaking sense. I've been pointing this out almost this entire series. Let's use Pinkie Pie as a direct example. Pinkie Pie can be very funny. She has made me laugh hard. Many times. But she can also be funny and silly and wacky and zany and in character. Or she can be wacky and silly and funny and zany and out of character. This one's great, this one pisses me off. Now, what does this have to do with this episode? Most of the stuff in this episode is a bunch of people being idiots for no reason, for the sake of, haha, isn't that silly and funny and zany? That's, that's why I, I'm relating it to Over a Barrel, because it reminds me of the exact same thing. Pause. While I was looking, watching this episode, I decided to look up several common worst MLP episode lists. Two things jumped out at me. I only read, like, five of them before I, you know, was like, okay, whatever. First, this episode is not on any of the lists I looked at. Second, Slice of Life was on most of them. Anyways. <clears throat> so. This is all stupid. <laughs> like I said... Uh, yeah, I'm not even going to mention the other episodes that were on those. It was a lot of episodes I really like were on most of them. A lot of Discord episodes. Um, the Cutie Remark, which is the end of Season 5, was on several of them, etc., etc. Anyway, so, water main, right? Okay, we need... He's drilling to go fix a water main. Uh, I had three problems with this. Problem number one, the one I've already brought up. Why has this Nardo been fixed? Maybe they just found out about this morning. Okay, we can we can take that problem and throw it out. We still are left with two problems. Problem number one. Um, he's already exposed the water main to work on it, so why is he continuing to drill? Problem number two. Why was the water not turned off for working on the water main? You ever, you ever do any kind of plumbing work ever? At any level? Because I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, the very first thing you do, before you even get down there, before you start digging, is you turn off the source of the water. That, that's true even if I was doing something on my sink. Never mind a, a water main. <sighs> Spike's smarter than this. Canterlot's smarter than this. Fancy Pants should be smarter than this. Yeah, imagine if working on on live electrical wires is kind of the equivalent here. So, you'll notice we're only like 10 minutes in the episode. I'm already pissed off. 
quick positivity moment. The Fargo... Yeah, I don't know what Cadence is doing this whole time. The, the Fargo pony shows up. And I really like her eyes. That's it. I just wanted to comment. They've, they're this really nice shade of, like, purple-red. It's really cool stuff. Anyways. And, yeah, from Winneapolis, that was good. That was good. Uh, so, this is our first, you know, complex issue he has to solve. Everything else had a simple solution. He didn't pick them, but they did have simple solutions. But now he faces something complex. Two people, two, two representatives... Two diplomats from two separate states or cities or whatever are both scheduled to make a, a, a speech at the same time at the same stage. What do you do? That is an actual complex issue, and it is. And credit where credit is due for this one issue. It's the only issue in the entire episode that's a legitimately complex issue. Because you can't just reschedule. I mean, they don't say that, but the presumption is they can't just reschedule. Because, generally speaking, if you say, oh, you'll just do yours at 3, well, then what do you do with the guy at 3? And then you, you get it. it. It creates this cascading effect of, uh... And you can't just move them to the end, because the end is after this, the event has probably already happened, right? So, how do you fix that? What do you do to fix that? Now... <laughs> The, I, I can't, I'm, I'm asking that legitimately, like if you guys could come up with an answer to that question, and feel free to, to answer on the VOD as well. You know, what would be your solution to that situation? I bring this up because the actual, uh, of the various options I came up with, the worst option I came up with was having them both go at the same time. I'm not saying that to joke or meme. That is the worst possible outcome there. Literally canceling both speeches would be less bad than having them both go at the same time. If you cancel both speeches, you are snubbing both, but you are snubbing both equally, and you can also explain, thanks to diplomacy, why it's happening. If you choose one specific side, that sucks because the other will take it as a snub, but once again, you can diplomatically explain, this is my screw-up, I apologize, please don't look badly on Canterlot for my mistake. You could also ask both of them to chop their speeches basically in half. Now, that also sucks, but that is something else you can do. You go first, you go second. Just kind of chop it up into quick bits there. Do what you can. There's options. There are several options, actually. I'm not going to keep going. Instead, Spike picks the worst possible outcome. Now, again... He's young, he's, he's under pressure, he's freaking out. Okay, I'm willing to give some credits for that. You know what I'm not willing to give credits for? A, the only reason he's, he's under pressure at this point in time is because of bullcrap, which makes no sense, and thanks to what is effectively the idiot ball. And B, the fact that, as I said earlier, Spike is exceptionally c comfortable with and familiar with this kind of organizing. He's Twilight's assistant. This isn't even just presumption. We have seen how good he is at actually organizing things in multiple episodes prior to now. He has enough of a brain to try and say, do this, do that, or do this, or do this, or any other option that he could come up with. <sighs> he is! We, we've talked about this since season one. Spike is the guy who's the connected guy. He's the networking guy. He's the one who's connected to all of Canterlot. He probably knows another place the speech could be reallocated towards. He could literally say, hey, why don't you go to Joe's Donut Shop and give your speech there? It's going to be a little bit more tight on space, but you could go... This is another option I came up with, by the way. But you could go there and give your speech there. Yeah, he used to live here, and he knows people here. That's been true since the first episode. But it's also been true since the first season. I'm sorry for bashing this point on. But I tend to not enjoy fiction that only that basically creates drama thanks to the mistakes and stupidity of the characters. Even if it's explainable, even if it makes sense in universe, what you're showing me is something where people are dumb and then drama, which is just not something I'm going to enjoy, even if it's done well. And to be perfectly blunt, I do not think this is an example of it being done well.
Okay, moving on. So we so we're past the big dilemma, the the, the really hard one. Then a whole bunch of people show up, and they're like, ah, I don't want the opinion of some random dragon. I want to know what Twilight thinks. Again, of all the stupidity in this episode, that's the one I'm most willing to swallow. The fact that they're only willing to listen to the opinion of, of a princess, despite the fact that they're talking to a freaking dragon. Who is the assistant, who was introduced by Twilight at the big opening ceremony. But no, no, no. Yeah, no, it's just... Yeah, that, that's got to hurt. In fact, I know exactly what that feels like, personally. It sucks. So, I'm willing to give you that episode. And that is important, because that's going to come up later. So then Spike, of his own volition, tells the guy the ridiculously obvious answer, and he's like, of course. This then leads to the montage where he helps people out with their decisions. I can tell them anything, and they'll listen as long as they think it's from Twilight. Pretty real. However, you'll notice that the montage and the next scene both line up with the idea that Spike is capable and competent at being an assistant. Because that's exactly what he does if you're paying attention. Now, this may sound insulting, but allow me to be very clear about this. A good secretary is invaluable. I would kill to have a good secretary, not literally. I, I, would, I would give this cookie. To a good secretary or a good assistant. That would be incredibly invaluable. Spike is that, for the most part. So what he does during the montage and the one scene afterwards is he's a good secretary. All the people who don't need to talk to Twilight, because they don't, and all their little issues he deals with and knocks out and clears through her schedule. Just like a good secretary should. All right. So, I like that that, that statement, Lord Harriman. I'm with you on that. Uh, you know, to use a video game example, everyone needs an Ignis from FF15. So, then he's like, you know what? I'm going to go work on her schedule. Yeah, I'm with that. That's awesome. So he goes and he grabs the schedule. And he starts going down the list. He listens to the 45-minute speech about the gems. We, we don't get any results from that, so I'm just going to assume that he actually did a decent job of that, but I have no idea if he did or not, because the, the episode never really acknowledges it other than one brief aside to Cadence. So, okay, but that's cool, and he's just going down, checking off the checklist. This is, once again, a good secretary doing good work. Then, <laughs> so, so the episode's like, like pulling me back in, and I'm like, okay, okay. Then he goes to the water main guy again. He's like, hey, yeah, I need to fix the water main. He's, she's, and Spike, rather than using any brain anywhere within his body, decides, yeah, no, we need to keep quiet. Again, as I've already mentioned, there were many solutions to that, but let's just move on. <laughs> I, I actually agree with that, Savik. That would, that would remove a lot of the stupidity involved. Yeah, his IQ just kind of goes... Mm. You can just hear it go. <sighs> so uh, he does. Not, he refuses to fix the water main, and then the episode pisses me off. Now hear me out, because the next thing that happens is Cadence shows up, who apparently has a free schedule for some freaking reason, despite how busy and serious and how everyone wants a princess. But no, she's just capable of just walking up and giving some flack to Spike for no reason. Now I want to stress that. Because everything Spike has been doing up until now has been fine. Uh, well, okay, no, obviously he's been making a lot of dumb decisions. But my point is, she comes up and is like, are you sure you're not doing this for your own sake? Imagine for a moment, if you will, that Savicom in chat was like, hey, I'm going to bake some, some muffins for my sister. And I'm like, really, Savicom, are you really baking them for your sister? Or are you baking them for yourself? Now... I'm probably explaining my point wrong. And Savakam, I, I, I call that Savakam because she actually mentioned this earlier. I feel very strongly like the episode had a moral. There was an Aesop that they had to hit. And they were like... And they couldn't figure out how to get to that Aesop. So instead, they were just... They, they did what most bad writers do. 
they connected point A to point B in the stupidest way possible. Now, I've said this before. Speaking as a writer, and we're going to talk about this tonight because we're covering Star Trek IV tonight. And Lore Reloaded and I have been just running into the wall on how to rewrite Star Trek IV because it's, it's a huge issue, rewriting Star Trek IV, because it's such a dumb movie. And so we're having a huge time with that. So it is a legitimate issue, and I don't want to sound dismissive about that. It takes time and work and effort and creativity and thought to connect from point A to point B. Because you know you need to be at point B as a writer. This is where you want to end up. I, I get that. And you're over here. But the problem is, because plot, which is what I, which, what the common terminology is for what I call the point A to point B problem, is, is dumb. It's always dumb. <laughs> Every time you just say, oh, because plot, it's because you couldn't connect the points, so you just said, eh. So she shows up out of absolutely nowhere and is like, oh, we need an Aesop in this episode, so Spike... Are you sure? <laughs> yeah, exactly, Lord Haramont. That is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. We need to establish the Reapers can't be beaten conventionally, so what do we do? We'll have Hackett, who's Hackett, who's been in all three games, show up and say, we can't do it. That is because plot. That is a perfect example of that. And that's exactly what Cadence does here, is she shows up and says, I don't know, Savicom, I think you're making those muffins for yourself. Notice that in this exact scene, Spike is suddenly like, yes, it's totally for me. And then the very next scene, literally the next scene, is him... Uh, oh, I wrote it down. Uh, very next scene is him getting the massage, getting the, the frankly, delicious-looking crystal cupcake, getting himself painted, and having the bowl of gemstones. Just absolutely abusing the power of, of the thing. Pretty much what, what is usually referred to as political corruption. I'm connected, therefore I'm going to make people do things for me, right? Yeah, it, it literally goes from him probably doing this to help his ego because he's been an injured... I, I mean, let me, let, me, let me rewind a second here. I'm, the episode has been pissing me off, and I'm not going to try and dismiss that. But I could see why he would be going out of his way to act on her behalf, not just to help, but for his own sake as well. Right? Because he's injured. Because he's hurt. Because nobody gives a damn about him. And because he wants to actually be someone important. Because every now and again, being in the shadows kind of sucks. Trust me. I used to be the guy in the booth back in TV. And... I'm just going to go ahead and tell you this right now. The majority of what would go on on the camera, that was me. I was the one calling the shots. I was the one on the microphone. I was the one telling which camera to do what where, controlling the lighting, and making sure the lighting setup was proper, and making sure we do the cuts to the special effects and the pre pre-baked footage we had ready. That was me. This is not bragging. This is fact. And every now and again, it sucks to be the person who nobody knows about and nobody cares about. So I'm with Spike on that. I am. And yeah, Obadiah Stain, great example. Iron Man 1, great example. It Because Obadiah Stain was the one actually in charge. Just like I was actually in charge there. Just like Spike is arguably actually in charge here. But every now and again, it kind of sucks not getting the recognition to go along with all that hard work. It does. And I'm with that. So him being, you know, upset about it, him him trying to make this up, him trying to make, make people listen to him, Princess Spike, I'm completely with all that. Yeah, Coco Pamel in this very in this very show. But the problem is the episode goes from that understandable, relatable point and just leaps off the cliff and goes straight into massive abuse of power and corruption. Literally, one scene to the next. It's literal. Jump cut, and he's getting the massage by order of the princess. What the crap? Yeah, Looney Tunes. Again, we have the Looney Tunes problem. You see why I'm, I'm not liking this episode. I don't know if this is Lamentation status, but this is not going above blue. Yeah, Twilight herself, you're right, S.A. Ross. Twilight herself struggled with this. Twilight was doing important work here and there, but she didn't feel like she mattered. So after the montage of corruption, that's what, that's what I'm just going to call it, it leads immediately to Cadence showing up. Cause she just has all the spare time. This is the third time. She's just shown up when, when she has nothing to do, apparently. 
So Twilight Cadence shows up and's like, what are you doing? Spike then gets all defensive, understandable, and mentions that he's been doing... It's a valid point, Lord Harriman. That he's been doing a lot of legitimate work, which he has, and then doesn't even talk about the corruption thing, as if that scene didn't even happen, which honestly, if we just eject that scene, I'm kind of okay with that. And then he, of course, does the, the classic thing, which... Okay, I don't mind that. He says, oh, what? Well, nothing bad happened. Immediately, everything bad happens. Everything cascades on top of itself. I... So, side note. Brief moment of positivity. Again, we've had like three so far this whole episode. He's trying to sleep. Um... Uh, Cadence goes to stop the water main with a, with a crystal spell. You catch that? It was really brief. It looks almost exactly like Sombra's crystalline spell, except multifaceted, multicolored, instead of just pure black crystals. I find myself wondering if it's literally the same spell, just, just reflected from someone who isn't horrifically evil. I don't know, it's just a cool thing I wanted to comment on, because... Then... So the water main breaks, and the area is flooded, and the trees are knocked over. But then, it's okay, because the statue... Oh, and then he sneezes. And Loner is quite correct. Because Loner is correct. If Since the water wasn't shut off, because dumb... I, I know that's the third time I've brought this up now. But because the water was never shut off... All Cadence has done has basically put a band-aid over the problem. And it will almost guaranteed cause more issues until they shut off the freaking water to fix the pipe! <clears throat> Meanwhile... Uh, the, the angry mob comes in. So he... Hmm. So, yeah, th this leads to him defending them. She's trying to sleep. They get even more pissed off because of misunderstandings and wacky hijinks are so fun. I mean, they can be. They can be. They're not here. Then Spike goes in. Twilight's been sleeping well. And this is, this is the best part because then she says, What did you do, Spike? And Spike's trying to flee because that'll help. And this leads to, you know, You made a few decisions? And then Spike gives this big speech with the with the uplifting music playing. It, I, I should have written down the speech because it's actually a pretty bad speech. In total contrast to the speech from the last episode, this speech is drivel. It also teaches incredibly the wrong lesson, as we've discussed several times. And then they all put the statue back together. And you know what? I want to give them credit for that. I'm not going to. But the visual, and this is the last bit of positivity I have, the visual of a statue that's made of pieces from all over the country that has been shattered, but then is rebuilt, that's a powerful visual. That, that's a great idea. This episode doesn't earn that at all. But... I think that's powerful at any point in time. Never mind right now in real life. So, big speech. Yay. Everything's together. All oh, forgiveness. You know, nothing's wrong. We'll move on. Here, have a bouquet of flowers. Oh, hey, guess there the dragon sneezes. And then he starts to sneeze. And, and this might actually be the single most wah-wah ending of any episode I've seen so far. This, this, this is like an epic level of wah-wah. When, when, he, when he pulls up for the sneeze and then cut to black. Oh my god. Alright. So anybody who doesn't want this to be like, give me your arguments about lamentation status. This is blue regardless. But if this ends up being black, well it wouldn't surprise me. This is written by Jason Thiessen, who I've never heard of. Neil Disadow, who I've never heard of. This is also their first episode. Jim Miller, he's someone who works in the IDW comics. For records. Uh, 
I will say this, the mere fact that we have to debate whether this tips over the line into lamentation says a lot. Uh, I will mention something. <laughs> the definition of lamentation has changed uh, three times over the years. It boils down to... Um, it boils down to just being Drek, basically. It, it, really, it really is the bottom percent, basically. But the way I've been thinking about it, and this came up in TOS and in Enterprise, the episode has to do something extra on top of being bad to push it into Lamentation. That's that's the thing. Because there's crap. Uh, I actually came up with this system, which you guys will see next year for the Enterprise and TOS stuff. There's Lamentation, one-off and two-off. And I started referring to episodes as Lamentations, one-offs and two-offs. A one-off is a really bad episode, but it doesn't have that extra little bit of ugh that pushes it to Lamentation. A two-off has several redeeming elements that help sustain it, but otherwise it's a very bad episode. But a lamentation is a bad episode that also has that extra huh. Do I think this episode is worse than Over a Barrel? Yes. I don't even have to think about that. Although, I, I suppose I did think about that, so whatever. But yes, I did, I did debate that. Shikor brings up a very valid point. This has actually happened sometimes. Sometimes I think about an episode, process it some more, and talk it out loud, and as I do so, the more I think about it, the worse it gets. And, in my opinion, a fictional work that gets worse the more I think about it, that's not a good sign. Here's the catch. I will go ahead and admit that I'm not sure this episode has that extra little, Ugh. the closest thing would be the terrible Aesop. That's, that's really the closest thing that really pushes me. Um... <laughs> Damn it, Valerian. That, put, that makes me think this might actually not be a lamentation. I will never watch this episode again. Yeah, this, this is on the skip list. I'll be sharing your guys' skip list in March. I hope you guys watch that. I think I'm just going to make it blue. As much as I... This is the worst episode I've seen so far. In fact, I'm going to make it like a different shade of blue. Just to kind of to kind of show that, you know what I mean? I don't think this quite qualifies for Lamentation. Because I honestly don't think it it hits that extra level of uh, that really, really qualifies. Yeah, we'll make it dark blue like that. We'll add a new shade of blue. Makes the text a little... Oh, we can just make it white. What am I doing? There you go. There. Just to really showcase that that really is just way down there. This is the worst episode I've seen so far, but I, I don't think it's Lamentation worthy. Mm. <laughs> this stupid episode. Uh, what is next week? We've got Party Poop. That's the Yak one. Well, that'll be interesting. And Amending Fences? Oh, I know that one. That one should be good. That one should be good. That'll be next week. That'll be next week. And then we have Do Princesses Dream of Magic Sheep, which is an awesome episode. That was also on a lot of those worst episode lists, by the way. Um, I pull it on Amazon, Valerian. But I own them all on Amazon because I bought them for my niece. You do have to buy them on uh, if you're doing that. So I, I think Netflix had them. I don't know if they still do. Is that the last episode? Oh, wow. So, okay, okay, okay. Shikor says it's on Netflix. There you go. Netflix does episodes a little out of order from Amazon. I follow the Amazon order, but, you know, you can just find the... That's why I always say the specific episode we're covering. But yeah, Canelot Boutique, really looking forward to that one. Rarity Investigate, really looking forward to that one. Made in Manhattan, that's a good one. Brotherhood of Social. Well, if you type in exclamation mark MLP, you'll get a link to it, Baron. 
Wait. Maybe you won't. Hang on, someone type that in really quick. Let's check this. Nope, it's there. We're good. We're good. So I remember Valvedrix banned the thing. Ah, Netflix has one through A. There you go. Uh, Crusaders of the Lost Mark, one of my favorite episodes. And the one where Pinkie Pie knows. That's a good one, too. Hearthbreakers. Um, that, I don't remember that one that well. Scaremaster, that's a good one. What about Discord? That's a good one. The Hoop Fields, that's a good one. Main Attraction, that's a good one. And Cutie Remark, where my favorite, third favorite pony comes back. So, I don't know about you guys, I, for the most part, I'm kind of glad we're over that hump of Princess Spike, because there's only, I think, one episode coming up that I'm not looking forward to. Yep, just the one. And that would be Brotherhood's show, Social. And maybe it's better than I remember. I don't know. But I remember it being one of those awkward episodes, so we'll see. So I'm going to chop off the local recording.